Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 557. That is 557 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga. I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. Wherever it may find you, I hope you're doing A-OK. How am I, you know, doing the best I can with the time I have available? I'm actually feeling pretty decent now. I think the first episode that I uploaded this week, my voice sounded mad because my allergies fared up all of a sudden. You know, the old hay fever and whatnot. My throat felt like I had a, a flipping rat stuck in the back of it. Um, my nose felt completely blocked. I'm sure you could hear that through the speakers, or sorry, um, through your e- earphones or headphones, speakers, wherever you're listening to it. I'm sure you could hear it. I really do apologize for the, you know, the real lack of quality in my voice when I was speaking, but I had to get it out there. Hope you guys enjoyed that episode. I know it's a bit of a mad one, but hey, please bear with me. But I'm feeling much better today. And I'm actually got um no, I've actually just um put in another order f- or reorder I re upped my prescription for one of my little asthma pubs that I use that usually gives me a bit of relief as well. The main thing is making sure I take my anti allergy tablets, right? But of course I forget those, even though I've got them on I've got a subscription running at the moment with Amazon where you get sent a box of like 30 tablets, you know, every whatever, every month, I think, or somewhat. Yeah, I think every month or every four weeks. So it's enough for me to obviously have in terms of taking one a day at least. But you've got to remember to take them, which I don't remember to take. And then, of course, sometimes when I'm feeling really tight and with some real tightness across the chest, um, I usually take my asthma pump just to kind of relieve that pressure, help me feel good, and usually I'm fine. I don't need to carry it. I don't need to use it every single day, but I just need that little bit of relief just to kind of get me going. And these last couple of days, I've been kind of taking a piss and taking my foot off the pedal and not really paying attention. And, you know, um, no surprise, I got punished and I got slapped in the back of the head, as life will routinely do that to you if you're not paying attention. But, hey, we are where we are, where we are. Where we are. Um, <clears throat> what else has been going on? I'm looking forward, actually, this Friday. I'm heading off to E1 for possession. It's going to be an absolute blast. I'm I'm pretty sure there's still tickets available. I'm pretty sure. I think last time I checked there was. Um, it's basically the full entire crew, Parfait, and a few other people playing as well. So that should be awesome. I'm really looking forward to seeing how that energy translate into like a place like E1. I think we're going to see all the kind of rave kids I like to see in terms of visually what they kind of look like in that sort of space. It's going to be sick to see. Um, it's not going to be the same as seeing it obviously in situ in Paris, but it's going to be close close enough especially before i head over to paris which is happening in august i've got tickets to that which is happening in august as a possession festival so i'm really looking forward to that but so far um just to kind of get my beak wet going to e1 see the possession party see what the kind of kids do want to come and i'm going to be i'm going to be observing like a zoo animal a little bit yeah i'm going to be kind of you know just on the outskirts dipping in here and there dancing a bit you know but just kind of observing and seeing what that energy is like and kind of capturing it because like i mentioned previously like this whole fast techno scene i'm not really i'm not really sold on it so far i've not really heard anyone musically that i can kind of say that i rate um as an artist as a dj i think they're all kind of very samey i don't think as much to really separate them um there's actually that one girl in the crew, um, not Buffet, the other one that was recently pregnant and had a baby. What's her name? She does a lot of uh, possession party, crew party sometimes. I forgot her name. Let me see if I can get her name up on here. She's some, She's quite impressive in terms of a DJ. I remember hearing her play thinking, okay, you're actually really good. The rest of them, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to, you know, no, no offense or anything. I'm sure they won't care, but they're not really, I don't really see anything really, really special about the way that they play or what they put forward. In my opinion, uh, let me see if I can find it. Where's that lady? So I'm sure she's French as well, and she plays really well as well. It's not parfait, it's another one. It's not that lady. Which one is that? I'm going through my Instagram. I was just checking for to see if I can find out the person, what they called, what's her DJ name. Uh, it might be this person. Is that don't is that her? Yeah, that's the one. It might be this one. Yeah, um, and Anita. Yeah, she's the best one, I think, out of that whole crew who I've kind of seen and I've kind of felt is the better um, DJ. Let's see if I can find her Instagram on here. DJ Instagram. Uh, there you go. That's her. So this person who I'm going to get up on screen now. Better be one second, though, my friends. So this lady, I feel like is probably 
the better of the DJs that I've heard play from that kind of fast techno scene, right? I think she's really good. Um, I've heard a couple of her sets and I've, I've kind of been impressed for the most part. But the rest, I don't know, man. It's all really samey, samey, in my opinion, personally. Uh, but yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing um, what they have to show, especially when it comes to London type stuff. I'm interested to see if it's going to be a different type of show, if it's going to be the same sort of thing. Will it be similar to what we've seen on video? It's my first kind of possession event that I'm going to go to. Like I said beforehand, I'm going to the festival in Paris in August. So that should be awesome. Um, there was a part of me that I was thinking I should maybe just leave the August thing and maybe do something else. But I'm thinking, you know what, fuck it. I'm just going to go in August. So that should be really cool to look forward to. Um, what was happening on the weekend? Oh, then hopefully seeing Ricardo and Lobos <coughs> at Fabric on a Sunday. That should be an absolute barnstormer as well. Um, it's going to be a 24-hour party, I think, from Friday to Sunday. But obviously, I'm working on the weekend. So what I'm going to do most likely is after work on a Sunday, pop over and see what time he's playing. Hopefully, he's playing from early in the day or early in the evening so that I can see him throughout the day going into Monday. And obviously, because I'm starting late on a Monday, I can kind of, you know, let it kind of go a bit leery into that Monday and have a bit of a good time. So it should be a bit of a good one in terms of the raves and whatnot. So I'm really looking forward to the stuff coming up this weekend. And then, of course, the usual May United stuff. And I don't even want to talk about my club at the moment because, you know, they get my nerves when we play at the moment. Incre there's incremental improvements, but I guess the... the, the the pain of being a United fan nowadays is like you're comparing what you're seeing. You're comparing how we are playing to our rivals. So you're seeing Man City go away to Sporting Lisbon and smash them 5 0. And then you're seeing us struggle in the first half against Brighton. Obviously, we ended up winning in the end anyway, 2 0. And thankfully, you know, off the back of that, I think it was, you know, the Ronaldo goal came exactly at the right time. And then the uh, Brighton player got sent off. I forgot who it was, might have been Dunk for pulling back Elanga. Um, you know, last uh, last man on goal, so that was obviously beneficial too. You get a goal, and then just right after the goal, you then get the you then get your opposition team get a player sent off. It kind of puts all the chips in your side, right? The advantage is on your end, so you know it's really hard to lose a match from that point. But overall, the first half, I think they had like sixty percent possession. You know, Old Trafford trashing us all over the park. You know, basically toying with us. And if they had a bit of better finishing, if they had better, you know, cutting edge in in the kind of attacking third, if they had better decision makers, maybe they would have ended up scoring, and they would have ended up kind of, you know, um, getting got, leaving Old Trafford with more than no points. But of course, we won, so I'm happy with that. Ronaldo scored great. Uh, Bruno Fernandes scored too great. Um, I think what I thought Ilanga was pretty decent. Again, I'm not really a fan of his. I don't really think he's ultimately going to be United quality, in my opinion. But I still think it's important to have players in the team who can function in whatever system the manager wants. And at the moment, in Ralph Ragnick's system, there's no denying that Ilanga is a far better right winger than a Rashford would be. He kind of, you know, he fills that position well. He tracks back. He keeps his shape. Obviously, because he's young, he's willing to listen to instructions and doesn't necessarily go and do his own thing. So that's always beneficial. Um, but yeah, loads of things to worry about in that regard. But yeah, we'll talk about that another time. But I've got, yeah, plenty of things to talk about right now. Got a, a lot of topics I want to quickly run through. So grab yourself a drink or whatever you're going to get. And let's just dive on deep in it. Don't waste too much of your time because I know that's precious. So. I was doing a little bit more reading and stuff around the whole new creative director at Supreme and just kind of engrossing myself with all that bits of information like I like to do and also kind of giving myself a kind of um, a bit of a kick up the ass on it because I've mentioned it previously it's quite cool and quite inspiring to see somebody that I kind of saw when I was coming up in the scene in London when I when I mean you know scene fashion culture whatever nightlife to see that person go from you know being at the door at certain clubs and basically getting people in at certain parties and seeding people certain things or whatever just being all around cool guy in the scene to suddenly then go be creative director supreme it kind of is a big wake-up call in terms of the things that I want to do in my career now do I necessarily want to have a job in that kind of field probably not do I want to have my own thing going on yes of course who wouldn't especially with the knowledge and the skills that I have um, at my fingertips that makes complete sense um, so it's good to see somebody of that ilk being able to kind of rise to that kind of platform and rise to that level amazing great congratulations but I was on um, Tremaine Emery I think I'll keep pronouncing his name wrong it's Tremaine Emery right it's not Emery it's Emery my bad 
Uh, so I was on Tremaine Emery's uh, profile and I happened to stumble across this post that he uploaded five days ago because I haven't been using Instagram that much lately. Not for some cool guy reason. I've been mostly you know, keeping my attention on Twitter to kind of build my Twitter. So if you haven't followed me on there, make sure you do twitter.com forward slash Agostino follow me on there I'm trying to get that kind of presence built up um so I've been kind of neglecting my Instagram but I checked on his Instagram profile and Tremaine has this um screenshot of a New York Times article that he took and he writes this following caption that really kind of pissed me off in general I want to kind of react to it a little bit and kind of offer up my defense because I don't think there's anything wrong with streetwear and I'm really kind of getting a bit fed up with this constant distancing and talking down upon and this kind of really odd conflation that's happening with this term streetwear I don't really think it's that deep personally um, but whatever let's just continue so um, Tremaine Emery's uh, post on his uh, Instagram page is the following the caption uh, a lesser yet a lesser yet also important note as per yesterday's new york times article by vanessa friedman streetwear is dead because it's never existed there is simply four categories ready to wear sportswear workwear couture calling someone a streetwear designer is the same dismissive establishment bs as distinguishing gallery museum art from folk art ethnic art tribal art etc link in bio personally for me I think that's very dismissive to an entire industry of people who are first of all let's stop let's stop this, this is the first thing there's nothing wrong with streetwear there's nothing wrong with being a streetwear designer I don't think being being labeled a streetwear designer is a demeaning term I don't think it makes you less than I think it's a particular field it's a particular area it's a particular um, sector of the fashion overall fashion industry or clothing industry whatever you want to call it but it is what it is it is streetwear no matter what anyone says i don't think you could ever have anyone with any sense that would argue that a hoodie and a pair of jeans and a pair of sneakers belongs in ready to wear like really argue about it belongs in sportswear belongs in workwear or belongs in couture it is effectively streetwear anyone that wears a a baseball cap, a pullover hoodie, a pair of jeans and sneakers is wearing a quintessential streetwear look, in my opinion. I've got to actually blow my nose before we continue because my hay fever is absolutely killing me. So let's just pause this rant for one second while I blow my nose. Oh my God. Okay, and we're back. Bloody hell, mate. My voice was sounding like an absolute madness right there. Sorry about that. A pause, a pause, a pause. So, as I was saying, I don't think anyone would argue that wearing a pullover hoodie, a baseball cap, a t-shirt underneath that pullover hoodie, a pair of jeans and some sneakers would fall under any of those four categories that Tremaine kind of laid out here, ready to wear sportswear, workwear, couture. I think the reason for me personally, why I'm so attached to streetwear, because for me, it was my gateway. It was my entry point into discovering many areas of interest that I'm now completely obsessed with, whether it comes to interior design, contemporary art, graphic design, uh, literature, music. Like, it's my entire gateway was mainly through skateboarding and streetwear. Without those two things, I mean, no, let's say three sneakers, skateboarding, streetwear. Those are my three main areas that kind of allowed me to be the person I am now. And I kind of hold them really close to my chest. And even though I've got, um, you know, a really in-depth knowledge of you know, stuff concerning fashion, especially the brands I'm into, um, you know, I read, I read loads of fashion magazines. I follow loads of fashion collections. I'm obviously knowledgeable about certain brands. Um, I obviously went to a fashion university, blah, 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 blah. My first love would always, always be streetwear. And I think the, generations of people who basically laid the foundation of streetwear who allowed kids like myself to have a voice to be able to kind of speak through tees to speak through pullover hoodies jumpers long sleeves you know tracksuit bottom shorts whatever it may be and have that um have that aesthetic have that point of view also be um able to sit on the rack alongside a chanel jumper or whatnot or whatever else high-end item you want to put out there I think that's just, that in itself is something worth fighting for. That in itself is something worth kind of getting behind. And for me personally, I feel as if there's this group of kids or there's this group of people within the streetwear scene. And I mentioned it previously, the whole streetwear is dead. Because again, I think that's a really dismissive as well comment here. So streetwear is dead because it never existed. It's nonsense. Because, you know, 
basically Supreme Streetwear, it's quintessential streetwear brand. Stussy is a quintessential streetwear brand in some way, shape or form, even though it's got surf and skateboarding um, origins. What it is now is a quintessential streetwear brand, in my opinion. Now, you wouldn't call it ready to wear. Would you put, would you, would you legitimately put a flipping, um, a uh, Stussy collection up alongside the same collection that you would put up from Chanel or something or from flipping, you know, maybe not Chanel's not a good example, from Margiela or whatnot. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Anyway, we'll continue. Let's run forward. The other thing that I think is, I think, in my opinion, kind of irks me in this regard is that I feel like there's a group of people, group of designers that have come through the streetwear sort of door, come through the streetwear sort of arena and have basically used the streetwear space aesthetic whatever it may be the low barrier of entry to allow them to kind of express themselves display their talents in order for them to get to their ultimate goal which is always the fashion thing which i don't have a problem with either because i think if you want to speak about it in terms of um what it means in a broader sense right what it means to have people that look like myself to be occupying those positions in fashion is really important because if you look at it you know if you like again i don't like to be the whole do the whole victim narrative thing but there's no denying that the people that actually affect culture aren't necessarily the people that are in the power positions in terms of production manufacturing and creative when it comes to fashion right they don't exist you go to most of the big fashion companies especially head offices and you'd be surprised by the people that work there and what they look like despite what they actually make what they put on the runway or who who gets seen in the product right it's a really the contrast is, is a bit stark and will kind of um maybe bum you out or inspire you to maybe get involved but there is a clear um there's a clear gap in terms of uh you know us as consumers and us also being reflected in those head offices so i understand if you're somebody like a tremaine or these people that get into fashion or kind of you know you're kind of fashion adjacent and you kind of want to be dismissive of the streetwear thing because for you the bigger goal the thing that's really going to move the needle in your opinion is if you get people that look like you to occupy those positions in the fashion chairs in the in the fashion you know sector which i understand to some extent but i don't think i think you could do both things at the same time i think you can attack the fashion thing and make sure that people that look like me are in those positions are have an ability to basically have their voices heard have their point of view be put on display whether it comes on a runway fashion whatever it may be when it comes on a runway magazine whatever it may be but i also still think streetwear fundamentally is something for everyone it doesn't matter what color creed you are if you're somebody who feels like you're not represented within any space in life when you feel like a bit of an outfit you immediately have a place you immediately have a comfort a comfort place you can kind of go to the same way people um found comfort in graffiti back in the day in mc and in you know break dancing and flipping djing and whatnot that's where you can find your safe haven because you can always find a little click a little corner for you they exist a multitude of streetwear brands on instagram that are making money hands over fist that i don't even know about that kids go absolutely crazy for they have all their roots are basically based on streetwear because they have the ability to basically put their ideas on really accessible garments like hoodies like long sleeves like t-shirts that i keep mentioning all the time and have that be their kind of call to action have that kind of be something that represents what they're about and have their community kind of build around that and involve customers in that bring them into their world show them different things blah 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 you know the common story about streetwear so i think both things can coexist but what i don't like and that's a tone that i got from the vanessa freeman article that i thought was absolute bullshit was this idea that somehow streetwear was less than fashion it's not less than if anything streetwear has more um reverence to it and more weight to it than fashion does i understand if you're a streetwear dude though if you, like i get it let me step let's, let's step back i get it when i went to my first fashion week show in 2016 was it 2016 let me see i got it up here on the thing actually yeah there we go this was my first ever fashion week show that i ever went to so big up virgil r.i.p to the goat right i went to the off-white for 2016 men's Wear show in paris um mostly because i was producing and putting together an online streetwear program which is why i'm so invested in this stuff right i actually built um co-produced the flipping syllabus a whole course um that would allow uh young brands to go from idea to basically getting their 
brand ready for stores and we put all these things in place and obviously Virgil was the kind of main kind of lead mentor with all these other side mentors that was also kind of you know helping out as well and part of my kind of you know job was basically to go and attend these sort of things so cool great um, amazing privilege I was really thankful that that position happened but obviously I earned the role don't get me wrong cool I did it and I was one of those people that scoffed at the whole fashion week thing. I didn't necessarily get it. I thought, oh, this kid, you know, people are you know, over the top. It's not that big of a deal. Um, you know, Paris also, I've had a bit of a love-hate relationship with it. You know, mostly family stuff. And also, I've been there myself and I had a really the greatest of time. And actually, fun fact, I was actually born in Paris, um, which is why when it comes to pronouncing certain French words, I seem to have a pretty decent accent because when I was younger, I used to speak French, you know, fluently. And then when we moved to England, in an effort to learn English I kind of erased the French so one of those weird things but I've never really had the best you know connection with that place even though I was born there but when I went to um, Paris for fashion week and I was given this invitation and I bumped into a few people from London that I knew who were working out there and I was able to see fashion week from like the kind of insider's point of view I totally understood why brands like palace and stuff were so quick to run to vogue and to alistair mcnally and all these kind of people and have them kind of photo you know take pictures of what they're making alongside these glamorous models because that world is far more glamorous and far more alluring than standing in a booth somewhere in the middle of berlin selling your line sheet to some store in the middle of flipping Seoul. i understand i get it right um, who wants to be standing around loads of bros in a flipping uh, trade trade room floor when you could be going to fashion week jumping from club to club you know taking bumps in the back of flipping ubers and getting given loads of free swag loads of free drinks have all these models being all over you and stuff and whatnot i get it i understand but let's also be fair and say not every kid is going to be able to pierce through the that kind of very densely packed um very highly regulated gatekeeped community or scene or industry that is fashion it's already difficult as it is now even with you know the culture being the way it is and basically hip-hop being the number one reference culture in terms of how it's basically being able to influence different areas of whatever culture that we're in at the moment whether it's fashion film whatever it's still difficult to get your foot in so to give kids this idea that the ultimate goal is always fashion i think it's full hardly i think it's, it's just it's just foolish in my opinion and it also kind of is a bit dismissive of the power and influence that fashion can have because the street that can have sorry because i think for the most part some of these guys without having the ability to put their ideas on baseball caps hoodies t-shirts and whatnot they would never be given the opportunity to sit alongside or to be adjacent to these fashion people anyway so this weird flirtation they seem to have is only based on in my opinion is solely based on the work they've done on streetwear and without it they don't really have much to offer those people what they want from them is the clout <clears throat> And it feels like what the streetwear people want or the kind of the aspiring fashion people from streetwear want from the fashion crowd is the kind of validation which they're never going to get or in my opinion that's why i honestly think but who knows but i also do get like i said the bigger picture goal is to have people that look like me in a position because if you really want to influence things maybe you would say that's the best place to go and also if you want to really get to the bag let's be honest working for an lvmh you know a caring is far more you're far more you're far more able to get to the bag than legitimately just working for your little um startup streetwear store that you might have a couple pop-ups here and there throughout the year i understand but i don't think it's fair to be dismissive of it because it just i don't know man there's just so much weight to it there's so many kids out there that legitimately can find so much solace in streetwear that can find so much direction in streetwear that can find so much hope um careers friends community i just don't like this kind of idea that somehow it's less than it's not um it's it's just it, they both can coexist there's no need to dismiss one or the other and if anything let's be honest especially when it comes to menswear fashion in the most for the most part most of my friends especially in the let's, let's be really really honest who legitimately is wearing all these luxury brands that everyone's talking about and gassing if you're not asap rocky if you're not people from the amigos if you're not ghana and stuff and young fuck who's wearing these designer brands no one i go to westfield sometimes and walk around and see check the shops most of the kids i see wearing or younger kids i see they're on a the thursday friday night trying to buy an outfit before they go out 
they're heading into Uniqlo, they're going to Paul and Bear, they're going to um, uh, Primark, they're going to whatever stores that they're around to kind of get something to kind of mix in with whatever stuff that they have, but they're not going to buy full head-to-toe looks in Gucci and stuff and Balenciaga, they can't afford that stuff, but the other stuff that I mentioned, the Zara's, the Paul and Bear, that to them is a form of luxury, and for the most part, the stuff that they sell in there is mostly, is probably closer to streetwear than it would be to fashion, so this whole kind of fashion thing is weird because the customer that they're serving it to doesn't look like me or them for the most part. And the kids that do look like me are the ones that are mostly kind of pointing their kind of, uh, or are spending their money in places where you would say the product is maybe less than what both of those sectors are offering in terms of fashion and streetwear. So that's the only thing I'd say when it comes to that. I just don't, I just don't like that. But let's just continue to read the quote that he screenshotted um this it says this follows it says calling someone streetwear designer is a way of dismiss them said tremaine the founder and designer of denim tears a brand that use jeans to tell a story the black american experience it means of control he says a denim tears tyson beckford sweater and uh, cotton reef jeans are part of the met's current um costume institute show in america lexicon of fashion alongside the giant bowl gowns from oscar de la Rente and or a gold um sequence from norman norell but the streetwear implication mr emery um said is that the creators are not real fashion designers and that they somehow don't come from the same pedigree and their output is less artistic there's an element he said of how out there you charge this much for a t-shirt how dare you claim an entry yeah but i don't know man I, I think this is all gas personally i think this is all gas because in my opinion the, why i hated that vanessa friedman article is because if you look through some of her previous articles at new york times she's done why in my opinion again it's not just her many people have done it she's done that weird fashion dog whistling thing where they say oh the end of streetwear finally the return of tailoring in my opinion when people say those kind of things that to me is more of a dog whistle to get the blacks and the browns and the non-whites out of here get all these ragamuffins out of our fashion place we want to see flipping pleats and you know hems and whatnot like and sequins like the, that's what that means to me um i don't think the whole like streetwear design thing means that i think that means you come from a particular school and let's also be honest too like going to a fashion school and actually getting an education in how to put a garment together is a far better way to understand how to make clothing than just making a flannel in your bedroom like there's no let's not conflate the two things it doesn't mean that if you make a flannel in your bedroom in a real streetwear cut and sew way that you can't take that and elevate it to a level where you can put it on the rack and sell it alongside a balenciaga flannel but let's also be very honest and say demna's education working in fashion and working for all these houses in terms of louis vuitton and working at balenciaga has allowed him to take whatever interest that he has in streetwear and distill it into be able to kind of create on that kind of high level in terms of fashion of course but we've also seen in terms of designers like jerry lorenzo he was able to take his aesthetic that he liked you know in terms of how he liked the cut of his t-shirts the cut of his pants and he was able to kind of elevate that to the point where yes he was sold alongside some of the more established brands that's also legit but to suggest that um just because people will maybe take more would have more value in an education than they would in someone just doing it in their bedroom is a bad thing i don't necessarily think it's a bad thing i think just to coming from two different places um they obviously still reach the same point in terms of um they in, in terms of the, the kind of canvas they're using because we're all using the same materials um yes different producer manufacturer but essentially a hoodie is a hoodie regardless of who you get it from um cool but it's still coming from the same place it's still coming from the same place it's still coming from the same place and um yeah i just i don't know man i just i just feel as if this group of guys you know especially the ones that are kind of highlighted in the street where is dead article the hair and prestons the rugi that's at bali it feels like to me they never ever wanted to be streetwear anyway they just used it in my opinion to kind of get to where they wanted to go to which was fashion once they got to the fashion bit they didn't want to distance themselves from it because it feels like it cheapens their brand but in my opinion i feel like they wouldn't be anywhere that they are now at the moment if they didn't come through the education if they weren't able to like especially in her Preston's case if he wasn't able to put gucci flipping stars on and nike air force ones print flipping bootleg you know givenchy t-shirts uh Rude wasn't able to put to make flipping you know um cigarette box flip t-shirts and stuff 
that's quintessential streetwear if you're not able to come from that point of view to kind of display your talents and your creative nows no one would ever give you a look in terms of being able to have a a brand or to be brought into new guards group or to be able to you know um head bally like i just don't understand this kind of dismissive nature that these guys have when it comes to streetwear if anything it's an important part of their story it's not the entire thing but it is an important part that should be told um and especially for someone like myself who legitimately spent a long time in the scene you know coming up especially i've got some highlight reels of myself here just to kind of cap it off of why this affects me and why i'm so kind of wound up about it you know like this this meant a lot to me this shit meant a lot to me this must have been like 2018 or 2008 or something um at some um crooked tongues event in nike town i've got a flipping hundreds paisley um t-shirt on very rare at the time a box flipping you know a box haircut who, who a high top well, high top whatever you call it right haircut who does that nowadays that's the kind of ref that is quintessential streetwear this head to toe quintessential streetwear you know sbs levi's 12 bar t-shirt a company that used to intern at my first internship in terms of a streetwear company uh, a vintage uh snapback um hat from a team i don't even know who they are i think they're the florida marlins or something i think right on the way to football or something another quintessential streetwear piece me buying vintage uh, basketball trainers and all these things are not new these things are st you're still seeing kind of iterations of this same thing being um done nowadays um this is me again back in the day 20 2008 maybe i don't know 1920 or something years old um where i think that's a houston Ost is it a houston astros i don't know what team that is um vintage starter hat right vintage like shiny gold here in the front satin gold a uh, snapback hat with a with a really cool Uniqlo um, down jacket they did when Uniqlo first launched in the UK around that sort of time. Um, and they were actually bringing over some really great pieces that they used to only sell in Japan over here. And then, you know, later on it got to shit, but it was a great jacket. I really regret um, losing it or maybe I, I sold it. I'm not too, too sure. Um, couldn't search the street where again, I've got the first pair of hundreds salvage denim on. That's something to brag about back then. Maybe not now because maybe it's not as cool. But back then, this was something to brag about. That like, this was a big deal. This might as well have been fragment denim. This might as well have been Vism denim. You know that was given um, by Bobby Hundreds back in the day. Big up him. Um, Hunter Dunk. You know Hunter uh, um, SB. Sorry. Uh, back in the day again. Hear me. He me wearing a. I forgot what collaboration that is. I think that was Stuti and Neighborhood uh, collaboration T-shirt with the double taps and Vans uh, chuckers. That is quintessential streetwear. And there's nothing wrong with it of course you can evolve you can go into other things but let's be um let's be fair to the kids let's give them an opportunity to cultivate their careers in a space that i think is more far more welcoming to them especially to people that are misfits people that feel like they don't belong then it would be in fashion fashion is already difficult for women it's difficult for women who aren't white right women fashion generally is an inherently what is inherently like um what you call it is majority i guess most of the employees that work within the fashion industry you would say are women right for the most part it's difficult to get into fashion even if you're passionate about that shit and you are really schooled you've got your education if you're a woman and you're not even white it's hard to get into so imagine someone that looks like i stepping in there and trying to get in it doesn't work cool so you want to get in where you fit in you find streetwear you be able to print t-shirts and suddenly for you be able to build this little brand you're now stocked in the same stores of the same places that were rejecting you that, that that the other time that amazing then five years ten years later down the line that aesthetic has now become the cultural currency nowadays right it's now become the it thing that people want to the point where luxury houses are willing to hire you to work for their company to reinvent it so that they can appeal to the kids imagine how um full circle that must feel to the guy that was getting followed around like myself you, you know getting followed around at harvey nicks getting followed around at um, selfridges there were times even i was to get <laughs> there's time when i used to get bad vibes going into stores like hideout back in the day and again hideout is a good example especially the older dudes that used to run it that were you know that they were a bit like cunts but you know later on when you started to walk in there with the right people they'll treat you nice which was always you know a bit harsh to take it's a bit of a sad realization you know all it took was some you stand next to somebody suddenly someone to think you're cool but those guys back in the day you'd walk in there you looking at myself and they'd give you weird looks now it could be because they didn't like me who knows i don't know what the fact is but for sure it did change 
as I was growing up and, you know, more kids were coming in and more kids that didn't look like them were coming in, then they couldn't avoid not bringing in the youth. Then that store started to get a bad reputation. People used to say it was a horrible store, don't shop there. So they obviously then changed who was on the shop floor and got rid of all the old folk and told them to stay downstairs and then put all the youngsters on the shop floor. Then it started to improve and it still, you know, didn't last for long, but still they tried to do something to kind of reinvent it. But that is where you get in. You get in where you fit in and then you can try and segue your way out of it. But I just feel like these guys being super dismissive about streetwear, it doesn't do anyone any favours. No one really wins when the family feuds, in my opinion. And I don't necessarily see what the point is of all that. I really don't. I don't get it, man. I, again, like I said, I get the general bigger picture goal. I get it. People like me to be in those positions or people that look like myself you know, non-white people, let's say, again, I don't like to kind of separate us because, you know, but let's be, let's call a spade a spade, those big, you know, fashion houses and, you know, the big power players in fashion, they're not hiring people like me in general. So, but even though most of the things that have been put on out on that runway, the style, the aesthetic, the lingo, whatever it may be, is coming from people who kind of represent the culture that I'm from. Cool. If that's the case, the way to kind of move things forward and to really change culture and really affect change is to get people to look like me in those power positions. I understand. But we can do both things at the same time. We can still have guys killing it on the streetwear side of things. And we can also still have people going full frontal on the fashion side of things. They're trying to kind of, you know, um, beat down that door and kind of continue the good work that Virgil did once he got hired by Louis Vuitton. But I don't think we need to do one or the either or. We can do both at the same time, in my opinion. But hey, what do I know? Um, next on the list here to talk about, we have. Oh yes, let's speak about this. We have to talk about this quickly, please. We have to talk about this. So, um, Mo from the formerly of the Joe Biden podcast, who now has his own show called Rory and Mo or New Rory and Mo podcast, he recently sat down with another podcast, talk about his old podcast. I know it's a bit dumb, it's a bit weird, and I've talked about this too much, but this still affects me, this still hurts me, so I'm gonna have to just, just, just allow me just to kind of, you know, um, vent a little bit, so Mo sat down with this podcast called, uh, what, you, what podcast is it called, anyway, it's a podcast with Smoke Diz and his friend, um, and he basically explained his side of the story in terms of the breakup of JBP, now, as I mentioned previously, that original lineup, JBP, with Rory and Mo and Joe Budden, and Parks and Savon and Screaman and everyone else that's involved in it was legitimately one of the greatest podcasts of all time. It legitimately will go down in podcast history. That that belongs in the podcast hall of fame. That particular lineup, not the new lineup. I think the, that particular lineup, that particular time, especially from I named this podcast later times up until when those guys left, was legitimately one of the best podcasts ever 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 i looked forward to it every single week it was a great way to kind of block out or to kind of you know you had to block out two to three hours um of your time it was always jokes a minute it would be you know legitimately one of your only podcasts you know that way you would be listening to it on your day sometimes i would be saving it um for like when i'd be going out for to do my um my weekly shop um and then you it's the only podcast that you legitimately listen to in your headphones and you'd be laughing out loud walking down the street looking like an absolute madman so obviously when things ended for a fan like myself it was so crushing it really was and what made it worse i think as a fan was that i don't know about you guys if you you're the same but i came into the podcast not being a joe Budden fan i kind of never liked him as a personality i thought he was super annoying super jarring and the podcast was a way to kind of, in my opinion, it felt like it was his rehabilitation. It allowed him to basically present himself in a more, um, with more context, because all you got to see of Joe Biden were from these radio interviews when he was trying to promote his music or him on reality TV shows or whatever, right? Or little videos and vlogs and stuff. It didn't really give you an idea of who he was as a guy. But then as soon as the podcast was there and he was surrounded by his friends, you got to really see the what he was about as a person and you got to obviously connect with the friends as well you saw yourself in them in some regards maybe you saw your own friendship relate reflected in them too or if you didn't have any friends like myself you immediately put all your thoughts and feelings um all your own personal feelings against them or you have this weird parasocial relationship with them what regardless it doesn't matter what it is but again we were sold a dream in terms of that podcast was basically a podcast with friends 
it didn't turn out to be a podcast of friends and then it disintegrated it disintegrated very quickly and that was i think one of the hardest things to take as a fan was that it felt like it could have easily been remedied if they were actually friends or if joe was actually the person that he pretended to be on the pod or if Rory and Mo were pretending the people were the people that they pretended to be in the pod but it didn't work out that way but i've always been intrigued about hearing mo's point of view in terms of in terms of the the kind of the principle of it because i think none of rory and mo would disagree with the assertion that they only have themselves to blame that's the other thing from the fallout of the joe Biden podcast right i think was that if we're honest as fans joe Biden has been doing this to everybody outside of the podcast for years but because we're fans of the pod we turned a blind eye and we also were the kind of people that said to ourselves he wouldn't ever do that to the guys right we always kind of were under that feeling. And I think those guys had the same feeling too, Rory and Mo, until it happened to them. Because, you know, you know, more likely than not, if Joe's the way he is with other people throughout the entirety of his life, it's unlikely that he's going to, you know, um, he's going to uh, exclude certain people from that kind of response. It's not going to happen. So anyway, um, Mel sat down with us with these guys on this podcast and basically aired out his grievances. And he had some really good points in terms of how he felt about the entire breakup and I want to play the actual clip for you now it's a bit of a long one so please bear with me but I think he dropped some really important gems here do you still respect Joe for at least starting the platform and that, that's the end of the question I mean yeah starting no. the, I mean <laughs> I mean no. you, you, you kept, kept it real. I don't respect him at all you never shake his hand again. Shake his hands. <laughs> I'll shake the room before I shake his hand, bro. Damn. That's just what it is. I mean, you know, because like I said, it was. It, it's not even about the business or the money. It's a lot of money. A lot of money. So I, I'm. <laughs> it's a lot of money, bro. Mm. That me and Rory walked away from. It's a lot of money that was taken out of our pockets. It's a lot of money that we still to this day we don't have no lawyers going after it. Keep it. We got our own back. But with that, with that money that we walked away from and with that, you know, what was owed to us that we walked away from, that was also me walking away from a relationship and a chapter of my life that once I walk away, you know, that door never opens again because it takes a lot to get me to that point. So once I'm near, I'm, it's over. You know what I mean? Mm. It's over. And it's just like, like I said, it ain't beef. Like, it ain't, it ain't beef. Like, it, Cause that was really my friend at one point. So yeah, it's not yeah, beef. I don't have beef, bro. Right. I, bro, listen, I don't have beef. I don't have beef with nobody. I always say I'm not beefing. Out. It's just a fall. I'm out. not beefing with nobody black. I always say it, bro. I'm not right. doing it. But you know, my number ain't changed. But niggas know they can't hit that line. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? Like I'm not changing my number. I got the same numbers for 15 years. Hmm. Certain people just know they can't. They don't have access to me though. You still got my number, but you don't have access to me. You know it's gonna be awkward if you call my phone. You know it's gonna be awkward if you text me. Like so, people you ain't gonna even do it. So it's like you know, do I respect him? No. Do I think that he's intelligent? Yes. Do I think that he's a, a creative? Yes. Do I think that uh, he's he's done some 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 good things with his life? Absolutely. Do I think as an MC is he is he dope? Yes. As a man, I can't. I, <laughs> I'm just cut different, bro. I don't mix with that. You know what I'm saying? I can't with people that move like that. You got to have integrity, bro. If you don't got... you I with niggas that's, you know, don't have nothing. I'm talking about they, 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 they hustle for everything. You know, they got a nine to five and, and some other into. You know what I'm saying? And they, you know, but they'll give me the shirt off their back if I ask them. And then I got niggas that's, you know, <laughs> wealthy. That'll do the same, though. So it's like, it's no in-between with me. Like, I don't care about, like I said, it was about money, but it wasn't about money. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It was more so integrity and, you know, you lying to your friends and you stealing from your friends and then it's just, you know, You felt you got ego. played. Yeah, it's like, yo, why, how you throw your, I just don't understand throwing your ego on your homies. Like, that's weird to me, bro. Like, I just. Nah, I don't. I don't I'm just not. I mean, I, I tease these niggas all day. But yeah, that's but day, that's that's what it's, we it's, do it's as yeah. friends. Like, we still, we but still, we ain't yeah. going. You ain't going. Yeah. You know, you ain't going to get a nigga nah, jacket and then when the chicks come in the room, say, "Yo, don't spill nothing on my jacket." 
Ah. Oh my See? nah 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 See? nah that's nah, dirty nah. game. See? Hold, that's up, hold up, hold up, hold up. I don't even want to do that. No, no, no. Come on. Now I'm all talking, bro. We potting. <laughs> See? We potting. Nah, just, no, no. This is your you look right. Nah, we potting because but, nah, bro. I watch these niggas, bro, every episode. You couldn't work I, can, I know my I nigga. I can talk Trust about me, this nigga. I know. All the views I can get these niggas. This nigga owed it me, nigga. I gave. I was a part of that money they was getting, nigga. I was a reason, nigga. I was on the home, home on the couch, nigga. I was a reason. You know what I'm saying? Fired from the job, nigga. I'm like this, nigga. That nigga Watch said it. I was a reason. <laughs> but he's right, and I'm gonna stop it. I'm gonna play the entire thing. But the sad thing about the situation, as well, again, because as much as I dislike Joe Budden nowadays, mostly because, you know, I was so invested in this narrative that he was for the creators and he was trying to rehabilitate his image. He was trying to, you know, bring his friends up with him and trying to make them millionaires at the same time. And it was them against the world and they were going to rewrite all the wrongs of the industry and all these labels. I don't know. I was sold a dream and I believe that narrative hooked like and sink. It was my own fault. Um, a part of me still wants to see him win oddly enough because i've come this far right it's like watching a really it's like watching a tv series it getting crap and then just sticking with it you read you're already two three seasons in you can't just bail it now you might as well watch it till the end same thing with this i want to see him get the bag i want to see him get even with this new lineup that i don't listen to i've not listened to a full show of the new lineup ever since it kind of dropped but i would like to see him be able to kind of rewrite the wrongs that he did with Rory and Mal with Ice and Ish for sure 100% that would be great to see and just for his legacy to be kind of you know one of the I think what what do you call it one of the um, pioneers in that kind of hip-hop black media podcast space it would be great to see Joe Budden get a bag like a proper millions bag right double double millions right do you know what I mean that would be cool to, I mean um, double digit millions that would be super sick to see but a part of me also thinks that kind of opportunity has maybe passed him by because from what i've seen again observing this kind of space of these celebrity industry type media figures from afar what i've seen is a lot of people get deals mostly from what i've seen again mostly based on their talent of course but a lot of it has to do with relationships a lot of it has to do with people just liking you and rooting for you and wanting to see you win and that's how I feel like a lot of these guys get in the position that they get. And then, of course, if you're somebody that somebody likes and you pay it forward or they want to maybe, you know, pay you back for something you did for them, when they're in the position for something, it kind of all kind of circles and keeps within a certain particular type of group of people, right? It's why you see the same type of people get the same sort of deals. And it feels like to me, especially when you think about how Joe Biden was perceived to most of the public that were the fans of the show, people never really liked him. They only liked him because of the podcast and he liked him because of the podcast he was sat alongside his friends who made him somewhat likable and the moment he fucked over those friends that people thought made him likable it made him look worse and i think in the eyes of industry people they probably saw somebody who if he can't get along with people he legitimately was friends with how is he going to get along with us in business Yes, some would say, hey, it's actually easier to get along with somebody in business because there's less emotion involved. But I think the way it ended, the car crash, the fireworks, the ranting into empty chairs or ranting out empty chairs, the, you know, the, I don't know, the arguments, the kind of, the fiddly veiled threats, all this stuff, I don't think that helped. And unfortunately, I don't think he's ever realized that damage that it did. Joe Biden, I don't think he realized that, that how much damage that whole ordeal did to his entire brand and to his entire reputation. Um, and maybe it's too late for that big deal. Maybe that deal is never going to come. And it must be such a hard thing to rectify or to kind of resolve in his own head because he's seeing two people who he clearly thought he was better than, who he clearly thought were less than him, leave the pod and go and make their own pod which you know isn't as good as what they were when they were together but still was decent enough and they were able to still collect a pretty pretty healthy bag from just the best of them and from what Mal said on the show he mentioned that how um, I think one of the guys asked him about oh what's happened to the skits they were doing and he said supposedly the interest has been up through the roof for the skits that so they're going to put a pause on them and just sell the skits separately so maybe it's going to be a show that they do 
you know, with Comedy Central, with Hulu, with Flipping HBO, who knows? So imagine the bag that they're going to get off that. They're already doing pretty well off the podcast alone. Imagine when that deal gets announced, how how much that's going to hurt someone like a Joe Budden, especially if he thinks he was better than them. But I just think maybe that big deal opportunity is maybe passed him by. And it's sad again. As a fan, it's sad. Even though I think he kind of, you know, made his bed, he has to lie in it. I think as somebody that was a fan of all the guys, even though they broke up, I would have liked to see them all win. But unfortunately, it doesn't feel like it will happen, especially when you consider how angry and frustrated, you know, and somewhat disappointed Mel still sounds, even to this day. So much time has passed. You know, they've been able to bring in brighter things and still there's a lot of hurt you can feel in his voice about how he was done by somebody he, he called a friend. Of course, it was business and you could say, you know, they should have been a little bit more um, to cut throw. They should have dealt with it. That, But still, man, that's your friend, bro. That's your friend. You know what I mean? <sighs> Shocking state of affairs. But hey, what can you do? What can you do? Move on quickly here. Um, let's talk about this story courtesy of TMZ. This is a bit disappointing too and really lame. This is Curse Your Team Z. It says, The baby sued by Danny Lay's brother for bowling lay, so bowling alley beat down. I'm surprised. I know some people aren't surprised. Be like, oh, I'm not surprised. You, da, da, da. But I'm really surprised because this story is ridiculous, personally, for me. Because, yes, you could say, let's just say, look, for sure, I'm not really, again, as much as I like the baby, I like his music, and I think it's great gym music i think i love him as an artist i think he does great music videos and i just love his energy i still i'm not a fan of this whole like bully boy thing not bully boy thing i'm not a fan of this whole like disrespect me i'm gonna beat you up approach to conflict i don't think that's necessarily a uh lo- i don't think it's a cons- long term it's the most beneficial approach to dealing with any kind of conflict that he has in hip-hop because nowadays it feels like just because you're willing to throw hands doesn't mean anyone else is and of course we know he's got that you know rap sheet of whatever he did in that supermarket um but still just because he's willing to fight doesn't mean everyone else is so why would you do that why would you put yourself in that position why would you risk your career the future of your family just so you can prove to everybody on the internet that you're a tough guy we know you're a tough guy just let it go so I'm not a fan of that. But in this instance, I mentioned previously, I still don't, th- I don't think he did anything wrong personally because I, I legitimately think, even though I don't have a sister, I think in, when it comes to your sister having marital or kind of relationship issues with their partner, their, their baby daddy, whatever it may be, I don't personally think it's your place to get involved as a brother unless there is physical violence involved. If it's them arguing, if it's him slamming the door in her face, whatever it may be, you have no place to get involved. Because most likely, in my opinion, again, just looking from the outside, people that are involved in somewhat physical, uh, shouty relationships, they usually always get back together anyway. So imagine how dumb you look trying to back your sister up for when you see her boyfriend you know, being rude to her or slamming the door in her face. And then two weeks later, you see them in the cinema, you know, kissing in front of the flipping whatever. Do you know what I mean? It's going to piss you off. So just don't get involved. It's going to make you awkward. And only get involved if, again, the a line is crossed in terms of physical violence. So as soon as the, the, the Daley's brother got himself involved and basically, you know, offered to fight him, the baby, there was only one way it was going to go. And I think also, if you're willing to fight somebody and it doesn't go your way, you should take the L. You're not always going to win every fight. You're not going to lose every fight either, but if you do lose a fight, just take the hour and keep it moving, especially in this, in, in their case, because they're two public figures or three public figures, right? Um, well known. And the more that you do this sort of stuff in terms of suing the baby, it actually reminds people of the fight because maybe people have forgotten about it by now. You could have actually gone on and moved on and did other things and maybe, you know, dust yourself off or turn it into a meme, whatever. Now you've basically shown people that it's something that's really affecting you. And you've also shown yourself to be a little bit of a coward. Do you know what I mean? You've also shown yourself to be a little bit of a bozo. A little bit, a little bit of a... What is it? A cloud chaser. What was this? Was this all Was this all a big scheme in the first place? That he wanted to antagonise the baby to the point where he would beat him up so that he could claim... So he could sue in the court. Like, what is this? This is super lame. Ridiculously lame. 
really really is um the article says as follows the baby's dealing with a more fallout from his blowout sorry from his blowout from his bowling alley beat down oh jesus my nose is going crazy um, of his baby mother's brother because now he's facing a lawsuit Daniel's brother brandon bills is suing a rapper over a recent fight in socal bowling alley lame according to a lawsuit obtained by tmz brandon claims he walked by the baby in the bowling alley when the baby suddenly attacked him leaving him with a severe injury and pain brandon claims he didn't fight back since the baby's assault resulted in physical and psychological damage plus medical bills and sustained sustained disability as we reported the brawl was cruel on camera with the fight spilling into the bowling alleys um, law enforcement say they're now investigating the baby for assault with deadly weapon because the baby was kicked to the head and because Brandon kicked the head while on the ground is that assault with a deadly weapon so someone's like really it forced a deadly weapon in that case okay the baby already claimed it was self-defense and he's been banned from bowling and he caught me bowling to bang a girl <laughs> Oh, then his bro is suing the baby for assault, battery, emotional, and negligence. We reached out to the baby's camp so far, no word back. What an absolute loser, man. He an he antagonized the situation just as bad as the baby did. He stepped out and, you know, was posting videos of himself boxing. His friend was gassing him up, saying he's got hands. Like, you disrespected not her, just a family. Bruv, you just, like, he actually did, he actually did an honorable thing. He stepped up for his family. You try to back the beef and you lost. It happens sometimes. Sometimes in life, it's embarrassing, but it does happen where, you know, your brother will tell you to go back some beef for him. You go down to the park to go back his beef and then you get washed. Stuff things happen and you both have to go home quiet. Right? <laughs> You're not talking to each other because you know that your brother got beef because you basically put your brother in a hard way. Some stuff like that happens. It does happen from time to time. But to go in and start suing people, that is the lamest thing ever, in my opinion. So, so, so lame. But then again, maybe that was his whole plan in the first place. He always wanted to do this. That was what he was really looking forward to do. He wanted to get into a position where he could, you know, cry wolf, get everyone to feel sorry for him, and then bang, you know, hit him over the head with a flipping uh, charge. Absolutely shocking state of affairs, man, to be honest. Shocking state of affairs. Uh, what else do we have here? Yeah, let's quickly should check some Fashion Week stuff. What are, they, what are people doing over here? Oh, my head's itching, man. It's not this whole like cool road thing isn't a vibe as well for me. I gotta be honest, it's not the strongest vibe. I have to be fair. The vibes are not strong with the cool roads. I feel like I, I, I feel like I need to beat it down a bit. It's like it's really itchy. And I'm the good thing about it is that my headphones are expanding like that, and I can actually wear normal baseball hats. But the bad thing is that it's itchy, really, really itchy. And I want to scratch it so bad, but you know, I can't. I have to leave the do rag on and leave it somewhat pristine so i can have somewhat of a fresh trim before i go to possession even though you know i don't care about my trim over there they'll be too busy taking copious amounts of ketamine down their nostrils uh what do we have here what do you want to talk about let's move on to that one we spoke about this spoke about that spoke about this spoke about that spoke about this i think we mostly knocked everything out of the park you know oh it's all like this actually it's, this is a good one um uh, yes i said uh, this is courtesy of hype beast stucci is opening a new chapter store in paris so stucci are going from strength to strength they've got this amazing amazing i, think, I don't know if this is a new picture it looks like it might be new this lady is wearing um, a, a, a basically a uh i forgot what that that shape of the jacket is but she now does it with the same sort of earrings with the stucci moniker on the side look absolutely incredible it's not looks really cool there's a video also let's see the video what it's saying Let's make some good money to see the top of the stone bit of a pandemic. There is big boy things. Um, so yeah, that's going to be a vibe, and I think um, ASAP Nas must have sh uh, shared a Stussy Nike in Paris Saint Germain um, jersey for their uh, opening, which is an incredible tie-in. To be completely honest, um, Paris Saint Germain, you know, even though they don't win anything outside of Ligue 1, um, they do have some pretty decent merch. Like 
you know, in terms of clothing that they make for their actual club is crazy from the varsity jackets, the training warm up kit stuff. Like they have really good stuff. It's just a shame the actual football club is a bit, you know, is a bit shit. Um, despite having all that amazing talent on the pitch, they don't seem to be able to put it together in terms of winning European trophies and whatnot. But yeah, this Paris Saint Germain Stussy t shirt is really, really, really cool. I'm sure there's going to be other things involved too. But let's quickly check over the text here. It is Alex Crate says here. Um, designed by longtime collaborator Willow Perron, the new uh, Parisian space combines raw materials like sheet metal, wood, glass to craft a, sea, a serene shopping experience, which the brand describes as a seamlessly bringing the South Carolina, South California point of view to the city of light. Accompanying um, the opening will be a selection of exclusive infused products, um, including Paris Saint Germain Nike top, a campaign t shirt shot by Marc Lebon, a trucker hat, and a Stussy chapter t shirt, and another T nodding to Tara Lebon's 416 campaign. Oh, really? What's the 416 campaign? What's this nod? Let's see what this nod's about. Uh, come on. Okay, so it's going to be a something featuring this sort of stuff. Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. But yes, do see store opening up in Paris very soon. So keep an eye on that if you're that way interested. I'd love the actual trucker hat to be honest. That trucker hat in that video looks really cool. I wouldn't mind that. Not gonna lie, especially if they've got like a tee as well and now or a hoodie or whatnot. That would look really cool. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. Um, wouldn't mind that one. And what else are we going to talk about? Uh, yeah let's talk about these these are really cool so this is courtesy of Hypebeast it says Yoon um, from Ambush teases a pair of Nike Adjust Force collaboration shoes which is a pretty interesting shoe to launch your collaboration with to be honest um, again I'm, I'm really interested to know what happens at Nike in terms of collaborations of retros are they do they reach out to a creative or a brand and say, hey, we want you to do a collaboration with us. Here's our selection of shoes that we're looking to reintroduce us to the market and retro. Which one would you be willing to kind of, uh, you know, do your thing on? Or is it the brand or creative going to Nike and saying, I would like to retro, I would like to have these retro for my first shoe or for my shoe as a collaboration. I wonder which way around it goes because it's a really interesting choice that she went for the uh, Nike Adjust Force um, very a very very um under what's your thing called underrated shoe model in my opinion it still doesn't look that great in terms of shape compared to the actual og we're going to get it up on here actually in terms of what you so you see what i mean because i don't like to complain without evidence so if we search for this on google what you will see in terms of the ogs in terms of shape Again, these are brand new. They come straight from the factory, I'm assuming. Maybe they're samples, so maybe they look a bit bulky just because of that. But still, if we look at the actual OG shoes, they look a lot more... There's something more to them in terms of the shape. Even this bit here. Look at what that bit, especially around the toe box, right? It just looks a little bit too bowy. There's no real shape to them, um, especially around the toe box sort of area here, right? It's nothing... The, the back bit basically looks pretty similar. And even that doesn't look that great, in it? The height of this uh, back heel tab doesn't really look too shabby compared to that. Personally, for me, I just don't understand why Nike can't just do what Adidas did with the superstars, uh, with the Adidas uh, superstar AEs and the campuses and whatnot, and some of the ZXs, and just, you know, reverse engineer some of the OG pairs and make new tooling and just basically make the retros based off that because for the longest time when I used to be on you know sneaker forums and stuff you'd always get people from Nike kind of dropping in from time to time saying oh we can't do it because we've lost the tooling we've lost the molds of the original shoes they're too expensive to make I don't buy it I think that's all bullshit personally I think if you're Nike and you're a billion dollar company, you should be able to just make new tooling of OG shoes. Or you should be able to just go out and buy every size of an Air Max Light or an Air Max 90 from a particular year and just reverse engineer it with all your expertise that you have and be able to put out an exact copy of a retro. And then you know what happens with that, right? In my opinion, if they're able to put together or release an exact to spec copy or exact to spec retro of a vintage shoe, 
right? And it re actually sits the way it used to sit when you used to wear it in the 90s, or it looks in terms of the shape, right? In terms of, think of the old school, like ACGs and, you know, courts and stuff like and Air Forces, like the shape that they had back in the day was just superb compared to what we have now. If they're able to do that, and then they said to Sneakerheads, hey, we're going to put these out. They're going to be a premium kind of imagine imagine they took like a vintage like imagine they just imagine this right? let's see a vintage nike air max one forget everything else just look like a classic air max one right imagine they went and they they kind of redid the classic air max one also let's get the get back on the screen here imagine they redid uh, the images right cool imagine they went out and they and they bought a pair of old school vintage air max ones there right? And they said, okay, we're going to redo these shoes to spec. We're going to get the, the old ones, right, back in the day with the big windows, like maybe not this from this advert, and we're going to remake that actual shoe, and we're going to sell it to you guys at a retail price of £300. People would queue up to buy that shit. It would sell out still. It would sell out easily. But instead, they make shit that looks like that, plasticky, crappy, you know, stuff that doesn't really sit right, or they, you know, or they make or, or or if you're lucky enough and you've got like a size eight foot or you put your foot down enough or you know what I mean you can make it look like that but that's not really the, the actual shape of the shoe let's not let's not be kidding ourselves I had these um, but yeah I'm just annoyed about that stuff it's just it's just basically a me me point of view doesn't I don't think most people really care when it comes to uh, retros and whatnot but let's go back to the um, what's her face Yoon shoes bear with me a second where are they there you go yeah so um all in all they don't look too bad in terms of retros i still think the ogs look far better although these pictures here of you looking like she's at the nike campus look quite encouraging but i think they might be ogs i don't think they are uh, retros i don't think these are ones that she designed so maybe these are a bit of a false advertisement in terms of what the shape looks like because they don't look as high maybe it's a different model I'm, I'm pretty sure it might be i'm not really too sure is it I'm not too sure but um yeah the shape isn't the best from what i can see so far judging on what the retros look like but in terms of having it available um to actually wear in you know nowadays i would still take it over having a pair of shoes like that crumble on me don't get me wrong but i don't know man it's just lacking a bit something in it lacking a bit something and then we've got another one here I've got pictures i think well a couple pictures of her actually wearing a pair and not smiling as per usual big up you i mean she was looking like she's seen something she's seen some shit in her life in it craziness but yeah look at that shape brothers like ugh, i don't think i'm over exaggerating here man i don't think the shape is that i don't think i don't think the retro that looks that great personally for me Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe it's a whole entirely different shoe. It's not meant to be the same as a retro. Maybe we're looking, I'm looking too deep into it. And it's just meant to be a, a newer interpretation of an old model. But look how great that looks. Just even there. Right? I've got on the screen like an, an actual old school, you know, fucking um, force. And it looks... Ugh. And you compare that to what she has on her feet. It doesn't look the same, does it, bruv? It doesn't hit the same, man. Come on, let's not lie. I don't know, man. I don't know. These retro things always annoy me, really, when it comes down to it. And for the most part, no one really cares. But, yeah. Um, hopefully, they come out soon. When's the date on these? And the hype piece, what they say here. No release date has been announced at this time, but it's likely that these will release soon in the coming month. So, yeah, they have no idea. When they release, we'll, <laughs> we'll find out when they drop in it. We'll find out when they drop. Uh, what's the time now? I think that might be yeah, I think that might be an hour already. And I'm already clogged up again. God damn it. I, I hate it. I hate it. If anyone has any good remedies for allergies, please get in touch. Especially when it comes to my nose blocking the way it is. I will definitely appreciate it. But again, thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If you listen to the audio version of the podcast you'll hear a song at the end if you're watching the show you won't hear anything and it'll just end right away but thank you again for tuning in thank you again for tuning in